Okay, welcome to uh, basically something that I'm going to be trying out, plus the fact that I'm going to hopefully be running a traveller section in the in the Cypher system sometime soon. And I had a few people say that they'd never played it before, so I'm doing this as a bit of a familiarise yourself with the Cypher system, or Let's Play Cypher system. Uh, and it gives you a good look. I'm going to go through the character generation sort of status of it and specifically talk about my traveler game but in essence the cipher system uh, can be used it's a universal gaming system so you can basically apply this system to any sort of style that you want which is uh, you can see that I'm on the cipher system website and they're showing you you know there's horror there's supers there's sci-fi there's whatever they are another sci-fi judge dready looking guys. Uh, fantasy of course as well and Indiana Jones will leap in here soon but I'm sure it's not Indiana Jones you know it's just a guy who's doing some archaeological stuff. So let's start talking about the cipher system. I kickstarted the cipher system um, was very impressed with uh, Monty Cook's version of Numenera well Monty Cook's version of Numenera is the only version of Numenera uh, but I didn't like the setting um, so the system itself I thought was marvelous it was really really good from a GM's perspective and really quite simple from a player's perspective as well so I decided to get in on the Kickstarter for the cipher system and here we are so let's have a, a look at a few things so um, essentially when you're going to be playing the cipher system you may come up as a group with the setting that you're going to do or the game master might come to you and say hey let's have a one shot or let's play a campaign based in this particular setting um, and that's precisely what I did so essentially I put up online that I want to play a traveler game um, and I've given it a theme etc and this is basically what that looked like to the people that had a look so I created this campaign design worksheet. These sheets are actually available for free on the download section. Um, I'm not sure if it's the Cypher System website or the Monty Cook store but they're for free um, and they're form fillable sites. So you can see here that I'm a bit of a guy who likes his music and momentary lapse of reason Pink Floyd. I've been listening to that uh, renewed listening to that recently and I sort of worked out that the titles have worked to a perfect traveler mashup so I'm doing a bunch of one shots that will be based off the titles of that album so the campaign is the momentary lapse of reason Pink Floyd traveler mashup uh, the genre is obviously sci-fi uh, being that it's traveler mashup based off Mark Miller's traveler universe kind of very loosely ie that's the style and feel that I want for it I'm going to be the GM now the types available, so there are four types of character class in uh, the Cypher system and it is a kind of a level based um, class system but as you'll see as we get into it it's, it's fairly free flowing. Now the four types are Warriors, Adepts, Explorers and Speakers. Now they're four classes that are meant to be able to cut across all of the different genres. Now you can see that I've flavoured these so my Warriors are going to be from the Armed Forces the Traveller so they could be Marines, they could be Navy, they could be Army etc etc. The Adepts are going to be the Psychics or people who deal with fringe science uh, in the Traveller universe. My explorers are going to be the scouts or the merchants of the world and my speakers are going to be diplomats or again possibly psychic empaths. Um, now there is a further section so each of those classes has different abilities and different tiers so you, you your level is essentially uh, similar to a well, your level, level is called a tier and it goes from T1 to T6 for each of these different types the warrior, the adept, the explorer and the speaker. Now <coughs> those tiers give you some generic powers etc that you can pick from as you go up in basic tier but sometimes it doesn't perfectly suit a genre so what um, what Monty Cook and the crew at his uh, games design sort of did was they looked at it and they applied these extra things which you won't find in Numenera and I'm assuming you won't find in The Strange, I don't have The Strange but they're called flavours um, and flavours are things that 
offer you the ability to manipulate or massage those those uh, character classes and their tiers so you can add in different powers so you can see that I'm offering different flavors per um, per character class so I'm giving stealth technology skills and knowledge to the warrior for the adepts I'm giving stealth technology skills and knowledge I'm purposefully not adding the magic flavor into there because there's no magic in Traveller what it is is it's psychic ability so and it's all about the narrative and how you narrate that uh, for my explorer it's stealth technology skills and knowledge so you're seeing a, a, a bit of a, a theme here but for my speaker it's just technology and skills and knowledge not the stealth side of things now to create a character let's have a look at the character sheet so I've got the form fillable PDF open here so we're going to create a character um, I'll give my character a name I'll call him Trevor Donnelly okay Trevor Donnelly was actually one of my favorite ever traveler characters that I ever played and he was a bit of a roguish type who uh, delved in um, side drugs and was a pyrotech pyrotech well I, I don't really know what you call a, a flaming psychopath but he basically could set things alight um, pyromancer maybe who knows okay so you when you create your character in the cipher system and in Numenera and I'm assuming in the strange what you do is you come up with your name so Trevor Donnelly is a and you put in an objective here which is called a descriptor and then you put in your type so that's the type that we have being warrior adept explorer or speaker listed here um, and you can flavor that with the actual specific type um, and then you have a verb down the bottom who so you've got is a and Trevor Donnelly so we're going to have a look at the the allowed descriptors and it's pretty small here and maybe it's not perfectly visible to you but the ones that I've ticked that you can have are basically appealing, brash, calm, charming, clever, clumsy, craven, creative, cruel, dishonorable, doomed, driven, empathic, fast, foolish, graceful, guarded, hardy, hideous, honorable, impulsive, inquisitive, intelligent, jovial, kind, learned, lucky, mad, mechanical, mysterious, naive, noble, perceptive, resilient, rugged, sharp-eyed, skeptical, spiritual, stealthy, strong, strong-willed, swift, tongue-tied, tough, vengeful, virtuous, wealthy, or weird. Now, you might be thinking at this point, what does it matter? Um, well, it matters because these things give you different abilities that you can add on and different effects that apply to the character. Now, I don't really know any of the effects, so I'm just going to go with the uh, the character that I want. So, Trevor Donnelly was, he was charming. Um, not terribly perceptive. He was very inquisitive. Uh, got him into trouble many, many times. A little bit foolish. So there are some here that sound quite negative, but there are traits that you get from them that are uh, quite cool. So I'm not going to rule anything out here. Um, but I think I'm going to suggest that he was probably lucky. No, he's not lucky. He wasn't lucky at all. In fact, he was very far from lucky. So we might go... What well, was the one that I thought that he was before? He was certainly very mad, but no. Creative, calm, doomed, driven, empathic, graceful, kind of, honourable, sort of, inquisitive, yes. Uh, lucky, mechanical, mysterious, rugged. Okay. I think we're going to go with foolish because he did things that just were so wrong and so foolish but that was his nature okay so we're going to be a foolish and we're going to be an explorer that doesn't mean that I can't have this sort of psychic ability okay even though up here we've got um, Thank you, Windows 8. Okay, even though we have over here uh, the fact that Psychic's under Adept, I'm going to say that he was somebody that liked exploring various areas. So he's going to be an explorer. 
um, with a stealth flavor. Okay, so we're going to be a explorer. Okay. Um, and with the focus here of so the focuses are different things down here so we have the ones that I've selected are battles robots bears a halo of fire blazes with radiance builds robots calculates the incalculable carries a quiver commands mental powers conducts weird scientists con uh, science controls beasts, controls gravity, crafts unique objects, defends the weak, doesn't do much, exam employs magnetism, entertains, exists in two places at once, exists primarily out of phase, explores dark places, explores deep waters, fights dirty, fights with panache, focuses mind over matter, fuses flesh and steel, fuses mind and machine, uh, hunts non-humans, hunts outcasts, hunts with great skill, infiltrates, interprets the law, is idolised by millions, is licensed to carry, leads, lives in the wilderness, looks for trouble, masters defence, masters the swarm, masters weaponry, meets out justice, moves like a cat, moves like the wind, murders, needs no weapon, never says die, operates under cover, performs feats of strength, Pilot Starcraft, rides the lightning, sees beyond, separates mind from body, siphons power, solves mysteries, stands like a bastion, talks to machines, throws with deadly accuracy, wields two weapons at once, works the back alleys, works the system, would rather be reading. Now I'm going to go bears a halo of fire because I want Trevor to be much like he was in the Mega Traveller game that I played in. So... My verb is bears a halo of fire. Okay, now, I'm going to start Trevor off as a first tier character. Uh, that may or may not be the case when we actually run our games. Um, and so we start building up some of these areas. Now, the game runs off the idea that you have three pools okay now your pools are basically your ability in certain sections so you have might speed and intellect and they're a, a pool of points now your might speed and intellect are also if you want to think of it from a D&D &D perspective they kind of when they are combined they are your hit points almost we'll get to that um, what it actually means is when you're doing something that involves strength, uh, you're looking at your might pool. Um, when you're looking at something that requires a quick reaction, you're looking at something that deals with speed. And when you're looking at something where you have to think about it, you're dealing with your intellect. Okay. Um, <coughs> pardon me. Now, what you have in those sort of areas is some points. Now, let's have a look here. I'm just going to have to refer to my book for a moment and get out and have a look at our explorer because it gives us the basis of what we have under our tier so I'm just skipping past speaker here we are an explorer okay so an explorer's step pools start with a might of 10 so we'll come down here and we've got 10 in there we have a speed of 9 and we have an intellect of 9 so very sort of even type character that you come up with. Now, uh, my effort is one. Now, what effort has to deal with is say I'm doing a might task. Uh, say I'm lifting a rock or trying to push a rock away from a door so I can gain access to that door. Um, the Games Master will give me a task rating. So he'll give me a how difficult is it on a rating of 1 to 10 scale. And so he'll say, well, that's a, it's a fairly hefty rock, but it's nothing that, you know, is going to require any machinery to do. So maybe that's a, a 4. Okay. Now to get the target number I require, we multiply that 4 by 3. Okay. So we end up with a target number of 12. So if I were to roll a d20 straight, 
um, I would have to roll 12 or more and to move that rock. And that, essentially that's how the entire system will work. Okay, you get given a target number. Now, you will realise probably at this point that if I gave you a target number of 10, you would need to roll a 30 or more on a d20 to succeed. So it basically makes it impossible. In fact, it makes uh, levels 7 through to 10 impossible to do. Now this is where we have things called effort. Now you can apply three things to a achieving a skill, uh, a skill roll. Okay, so one is a level of effort. So if I want to really give it my all and push myself, then I can apply a level of effort using my might. Okay, now to get that first level of effort, I, th I believe the, the first level of effort cost me three points. So I would reduce my might score. Okay, so here's my pull down here by three. So I've used three of my might score, and that brings the difficulty number down by uh, by three. So it goes from a difficulty four to a difficulty three. So I would now need to roll a nine plus. So with one level of effort, I have essentially made it a 50-50, or a slightly better than a 50-50 chance, 55-45 chance. Um, and that's essentially it. So I could roll the dice there, but say that I had a crowbar as an item upon me, a piece of equipment, and I had a crowbar or a, a large lever, um, then I could use that to apply a level of effort as well. So uh, essentially, so you've now got effort and you've got equipment, okay, or uh, ability. So if it was knowledge, perhaps you've got a book on a particular race that you're exploring, and that lowers your difficulty by one. Um, so I use my lever to apply another level of effort, so I've got two levels now that reduce my difficulty number from four down to two now. Um, and the other thing is we might have a cipher available to us. Now ciphers we'll talk about in the in a, in a little bit, but essentially ciphers can also do the, a similar section. So say I've got a device that helps le uh, reduce gravity in a nearby area. Okay, I could use that cipher. Cipher would be used and discarded because ciphers are one-use objects. Um, but I could reduce that by three and we go down to now from a difficulty four to a difficulty one. Uh, one times three gives me three for the target number on the d20 so I need to roll a three or above uh, to succeed at moving the rock. And that's essentially how the game works. Um, if you reduce a target number down to zero, then you don't need to roll because you've already done it. Okay, so th there's there's that ability. Um, but let's get back into the character creating sort of area. So uh, they've got little background bits and pieces and stuff like that. I'm not going to go terribly much into those sorts of things. But we're just choosing currently the character type. Okay, so we'll go through, I've chosen my um, my explorer. Okay, uh, first tier explorer, so my effort is one, my physical nature, you have a might edge of one. Now edge is something that I didn't mention and I should have really paid attention to when I did this because it would have had an effect. Okay, so when I apply a level of effort, if I have an edge, you minus that off the level of effort. So I can only apply one level of effort, but I get a minus one off the number of points I need to spend. So I do need to spend three points, but because I've got an edge of one, I only need to spend two. So my pool would have dropped to eight. If it was a speed skill or an intellect skill, though I have zero edge in it, so I would have had to pay full cost. Any level of effort after the first, because as you go up in tiers, you can increase the amount of effort you're allowed to use. Um, any level after the first is actually costs two, so it's only three for the first level. Okay, cipher use. I can bear two ciphers at a time. So is there a place for me to put that on my character sheet? Um, background notes, portrait. No, not really. So we can 
pop that in the cipher section okay I can pop that in the top of top thing just reminding me that I can only bear two ciphers at a time I am practiced with light and medium weapons so we pop that in so that essentially all weapons are do a certain amount of damage based on the size that they are so light medium and there's obviously heavy as well um, practice with light, uh, starting equipment I have appropriate clothing and a weapon of your choice plus two expensive items two moderately priced items and up to four inexpensive items okay so let's start with the top of what that all came down with I have appropriate clothing so I will have a um, grab suit because I'm going to make him a bit of a pilot to start with and um, you only put down what's important here obviously appropriate clothing or weapon of your choice so I'm going to have a blaster don't know what we'll call them laser pistol laser pistols probably better blasters very um, Star Wars so we'll go laser pistol um, I have two expensive items so I'm going to have a scout spaceship we'll give him let's see a sports grab car because he was very flashy and liked to show off how successful he was so there's our two expensive thing two moderately priced items um, so hmm not really so let's go a Let's go a portable superpower computer. I'm sure that they can do that in the future. Uh, computer. And we'll have a hmm, moderately priced traveler item let's go a grab belt um, then we will want a scanner for life and stuff like that if we're doing exploring type stuff um, communicator and let's say Two, so this will this will take up the four inexpensive items. Two recharge packs for the laser pistol, just in case we run out. Wait, the if the GM throws a complication at us, which is something that they do when you roll a one, or sometimes just for fun, they throw you a complication. They might go, oh, you pull the trigger and nothing happens. It looks like you're out of charge. And I can say, uh-huh, well, then I have a recharge pack for my laser pistol uh, stored directly away. Um, okay. So now we go on to our special abilities. So choose four of the abilities described below. So we have block. You automatically block the next melee attack made against you within the next minute. Action to initiate. So not really appealing to me. Danger sense. The difficulty of your initiative roll is reduced by one step and that's an enabler. Now an enabler means that it's always on. Um, so special abilities, I'm definitely having that one. Danger sense. And it costs one speed point. So when it activates I have to spend a point out of my speed pool. Okay, so yeah, the, there it is. And I can do it at any time. Decipher. If you spend one minute examining a piece of writing or code in a language you do not understand, you can make an intellect roll difficulty three or higher based on the complexity of the language or code to get the gist of the message. Action to initiate. 
maybe. Uh, endurance, any duration dealing with physical actions is either doubled or halved, whichever is better for you. Um, for example, if a typical person can hold his breath for 30 seconds, you can hold it for one minute. Uh, if a typical person can march for four hours, you can do it for eight. Um, so, but if poison was paralyzing me for one minute, then it only paralyzes me for 30, section, 30 seconds. Uh, that's really quite handy, but I'll sort of have a look at what else we've got here, because the next one I see says Extra Edge. And you can see I'm typing that one down already, because this one gives me a might, uh, you have a might edge of one and a speed edge of one. Okay, so now I actually have edge in two of the three pools. So 66% of the time, theoretically, based on an even distribution of tasks, I'm actually going to reduce the costs from my pool by one, which is really quite handy. So I've only got two more to go. Now we've got um, fleet of foot, uh, can move a short distance and take an action in the same round. Now the, you'll learn when you get into the game that uh, distances are covered in immediate, short and long. Um, so it's very non-specific uh, and generic, and it's it's quite a good system. Uh, it's kind of similar to to fate zones if you're aware of fate and the zones. You have knowledge skills. You are trained in two skills in which you are not already trained. Choose two areas of knowledge, such as whatever. Um, so that's an enabler. That's also kind of handy. Muscles of iron. So you spend two might points, and for the next ten minutes. All might related based actions other than attack rolls are reduced by one step. Um, no need for weapons, uh, so that's an unarmed combat sort of skill. So if you're fighting somebody with a sword or something like that, you can do that. Physical skills, you're trained in two skills of which you are not already trained in. Choose two of the following. Uh, okay, practiced in armor. You can wear armor for long periods of time without tiring. You can compensate for slowed reactions from wearing armor. Uh, you can wear any kind of armor. You reduce the speed cost by wearing armor by one. Now that's good, but I didn't really take any armor, so that's not really decent for me. Practice with all weapons. I've only really need a laser pistol, so I don't really need that. Searching confidence. When you use an action to make your first recovery roll of the day, you immediately gain another action. So that's an enabler and trained without armor. You're trained in speed defense actions when not wearing armor. Okay, I'm going to take that one, definitely trained without armor, because I don't wear armor. I've got a grav suit, but that's not armor. I'm trained without armor. Okay, it doesn't cost anything to, to use, and it basically means that I count as trained. So that's another extra thing that I didn't mention. I mentioned ciphers items and effort, but if you're trained in a skill, so under skill here, so when wearing no armor, speed defense. So that means if somebody shoots at me and I try to get out of the way, I'm counted as trained in it, so it reduces it by an effort level. Uh, so that's one, two, three. Let's go back to a couple of the ones that I sort of liked, and I think I am going to go endurance. Okay, because I do vaguely remember that Trevor Donnelly spent a little bit of time floating in space once, and so that would have required some endurance. So we'll go there. Just a reminder that that doubled anything, so I can hold my breath for twice the amount of time, and environmental effects half the time on those. So that's certainly sort of where we want to be with that. Okay. Now... Let's just skip back a little bit. Creating your character, character stats. Okay. Oh, cool. Okay, so where are we? There we are, multiple use, stat examples. 
just pause for a moment while I work out precisely the next step. I'm bearing in mind that we need to check out uh, our descriptors and our focus, but I'll make sure that that's the right place to go, and I'll be back in a moment. Okay, I'm back and fairly certain that we know where we're going next. Uh, one thing that I did forget to sort of point out to you was the effects of the flavours. I did mention that we would be able to use the stealthy flavour. So right at the end of um, our character types, there's a, a covering of different flavours. Now I chose the stealth flavour um, to add and that means I could have chosen different special abilities so let me just find the stealth flavor I think it's actually one of the first ones that's there technology here we are stealth so first here I could have chosen uh, danger sense which I already have fleet of foot which I chose not to choose uh, goad so you could um, sort of basically taunt someone. Ledger Domain be a sort of um, sleight of hand. Uh, opportunist if I wanted to sort of sneak up on somebody. Stealth skills. Um, so I'm going to go back and have a look at these ones that I've got and I'm going to insert stealth skills instead. Okay so out of all of these I will lose my endurance so I can have stealth skills. Now there are, is no fixed um, skill list in Cypher system. There can be various skills for whatever. So essentially, before we move on to that, the flavor has different tier abilities and so you can swap them in and out instead of having what's in your character class, you can have this. So as I've taken the stealth flavor, I'm taking stealth skills, which tells me I'm trained in uh, my choice of the following skills. I can have disguise, deception, lock picking, pickpocketing, see through deception, sleight of hand or stealth um, and I'm going to choose uh, deception and stealth so deception is more of an intellect skill so I'm going to put it in here so there's deception and I'm trained in it um, and stealth is probably could be speed could be intellect probably speed so we'll go stealth in there and I'm trained. So whenever I'm doing something stealthy or I'm trying to deceive someone, I have an asset in that degree. In other words, I bring that uh, that task number down. So if they give me a difficulty five in trying to tell this guy, uh, you know, that I'm I'm on the list, then it automatically becomes difficulty four because I've got a skill that's related to it. Okay. <clears throat> so from this point, we need to have a look at our descriptors and our verbs about what we do. So first of all, my descriptor, which is I'm foolish. So if we skip to the foolish descriptor, not everyone can be brilliant. Oh, you don't think yourself as stupid and you're not. It's just that others might have a bit more wisdom. So I am unwise, which means I get negative four to my intellect pool. Okay, so... Uh, so that drops there, we'll get rid of that as well. Okay. Um, actually, now that I look at it, they're probably what you currently got. So we'll say that I've got 10 pool, 9 pool, and 5 pool. Okay, and the, the boxes up top tell me what I've currently got. Um, okay, I'm carefree. You succeed more on luck than anything. Every time you roll for a task, roll twice and take the higher result. Uh, roll twice for all tasks. Take higher result. Now that is superb. Now you can see the foolish is a uh, Probably a descriptor you might not think about taking because it gives me a negative and it does give me a huge negative. It makes me a bit, well, largely quite dumb. Um, but it also gives me this ability to roll twice and take for all tasks. So what else have we got? Intellect weakness. Anytime you spend points from your intellect pool, it costs one more point as you, as more than usual. Uh, points from intellect pool. 
equal point plus one. Okay, and I've got inability. The difficulty of any intellect defense task is increased by one step. Intellect defense task increased by one step. Now, uh, inability, what have we got? Uh, the difficulty of any task that involves seeing through a deception, an illusion or a trap is increased by one step. Um, intellect defense task, seeing through illusion, Um, what's the next one? Trap or deception. It's increased by one step. Then they give you some links to the adventure, the starting adventure, so you can choose one or you can select one. So I've, I've got here, who knows, seemed like a good idea at the time, which is pretty apt, really. Uh, someone asked you to join up with the other PCs. They told you not to ask too many questions and seem fine to you. Uh, your parent got involved to give you something to do and maybe teach you some sense and the other PCs needed some muscle that wouldn't overthink things. So we'll probably go with who knows, seemed like a good idea at the time. Because in essence I'm setting him up as a bit of a scout here so he would be off researching new planets etc. So that's everything that it does. Now you can see there that my descriptor, which is foolish, uh, a negative descriptor certainly. It gives me a lot of negatives. It gives me um, okay points from the intellect pool. Cost me one extra to to spend. Intellect defense tasks, seeing through illusions, traps or dissensions, uh, increased by one step. So if I come across a guy that's lying to me and he's a uh, task 4, it's actually a task 5 for me to see through it because I'm just so trusting or I just I've got no sense. I'm foolish. However, um, foolish uh, it sort of favours the brave. Fortune favours the brave, I suppose, if you want to think. And if you want to think of foolish as brave, then you can sort of go, well, you get to roll two dice on every, basically, task you do if that requires a dice roll, and I get to take the highest. Now, that's a huge advantage. So, pretty glad I took it. Didn't know it was going to turn up like that, but it did. So we've already done the Explorer stuff. The last thing that we've got to do here is bears a halo of fire, okay, which is my focus. So I flick along to my focus, which is not too far away. Battles robots, got to be close. Bears a halo of fire. Uh, create a sheath of flames around your body, you lose scorch marks wherever you go and you can't handle combustible objects without first dousing your inherent flames. Um, okay, so all of my effects are tainted with flames. So first of all we look at a connection, how we got involved in various things. Um, Okay, there's a there's a bunch of them there. It's not really all that important uh, for me at this point because I'm not actually going to be playing this character in a game. But if I was, I would certainly pay attention to that. Uh, additional equipment. You have an artifact, a device that sprays inanimate objects to make them fire resistant. All your starting gear has been already treated unless you don't want it. So I have an artifact. Okay, which we're going to put here under the ciphers. So, flame resistant spray. So that basically means anything that I have that I own, I spray in it and it's not affected by the flames that I create. Which is good when you think about it because you don't want it all to burn up the first time that I bear a halo of fire. Fire abilities. If you perform special abilities, those that would normally use force or other energy, such as electricity, use blasts of flame. Okay. Um, uh, okay. So essentially, like when I'm using my laser or anything like that, uh, it uses bolts of flame instead of the laser. The light that comes from it, etc., will will shoot um, bolts of flame. Um, 
So we'll pop that down here. I have fire abilities. And T1, Shroud of Flame. At your command, your entire body becomes shrouded in flames that last up to 10 minutes. Fire doesn't burn you, but it automatically inflicts 2 points of damage to anyone who tries to touch you or strike you with a melee attack. Flames from another store source can still hurt you while the Shroud is active. You gain plus 2 uh, to armor only against damage from fire from another source. So I have Shroud of Flame, and it costs an intellect point. So... That is a bit annoying because I'm going to have to spend two intellect points to activate that. Okay, because of that ability that we had up here, which is points from intellect pool equals points plus one. So it actually cost me two intellect points to bear a halo of flame. Now there are different uh, abilities. Uh, that continue on. So tier 2 is Hurl Flame, tier 3 is Fiery Hand of Doom, tier 4 is Flame Blade, tier 5 Fire Tendrils, and tier 6 Fire Servant. Okay, so in essence, uh, that's where my sort of character goes. Two ciphers, fuck, cutting equipment, okay. Okay, so in essence, what we've done is we've created my character. I do believe you get one extra skill um, to choose from, so you can have whatever you want. It's going to be an intellect skill, bugger, but it's going to be pilot, so I can fly my spacecraft, and I'm trained in that. But apart from that, my character's ready to go. I've got my um, my pools all set up, my edges all set up, I've got my descriptors etc and my details down. Okay, I would create things here in the background so when I've got it connected because of the focus and because of the descriptor I would fill those out. So for those of you that sort of like sort of keeping your notes etc, you got that there and you've got a portrait section, she's all good. It's a, it's a brilliant sort of little character sheet you have. Um, uh, so essentially that's all there is to it. The The main thing really is being able to choose this descriptor, your type and your focus and sort of like with the campaign sheet that I've provided here. Um, so for the, those of you that are playing in my Traveller game you can sort of get an idea. Now for the first one which is um, Signs of Life, uh, I'm going to want everybody to be playing Explorers of some form but it really you might be able to fashion an explorer from a warrior using these focuses okay so you can um, do those sorts of things with that style your base type can be something completely different you can be the face person but you can um, say perform feats of strength okay so you're the one that chats but you lift people up over your head and then uh, hurl them through a wall or something like that. So you can actually, with a bit of detail, have a look at this sort of thing. An explorer is somebody who's inquisitive. So you could be a warrior that's inquisitive who's always looking for trouble. These are the ways we go. Anyway, that's the base understanding of how you create a cipher character. Um, cipher system, I really like the look of this. I haven't run a game yet, the Cypher system, unless you count the fact that I've run a new Monero game. Um, but I really, really do like this system. Um, and quite honestly, the GM advice section or the Game Master, Master section of this book should be almost mandatory reading for new GMs. Anyway, that's uh, Mark Knights. I'm from RPGNights.com, the blog. I also own Games-Onboard.com the online store and also bricks and mortar store within the next month um, and hopefully you get a game of cipher system going soon until then um, keep rolling thanks